Welcome to the Power for Life. This broadcast brings to you a message of life-changing revival in the Holy Spirit. We pray that today's program will help to spur you on to experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in your life. Now here with today's message is Tom Hill. For our Bible study today, I want us to examine the great biblical doctrine of the sovereignty of God. But before we get into it, I would like to just briefly define and describe what I mean when I say the sovereignty of God. What we are talking about here is the doctrinal truth from Scripture that describes God as being the sovereign ruler of His creation. That means He has sovereign control over people. He has sovereign control over all of the other aspects of his creation, such as the weather and animals and trees and all other kinds of life. In addition, he also has control over events that confront us in our everyday experience. So when we talk about the sovereignty of God, we are describing a God who is living, who is active, who is in control of his creation. There are many people who view God as kind of like a kindly old grandfather who sits way off in the heavens somewhere who really does nothing. He observes and he is aware of what's going on on the earth, but he isn't involved. He's kind of a hands-off, if you will, God. But the scriptures describe God in much different terms than that. It describes a deity that is vitally, actively involved in all aspects of his creation. And the sovereignty of God helps us to see his kingship, his dominion, his authority in all areas of life. And the scriptures speak a great deal about this doctrine, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And there are numerous examples of characters and real life situations that prove and show the sovereignty of God. And today I want us to examine one of those real life circumstances from Scripture that show the sovereignty of God. And the one I want us to examine is the life of Joseph. You probably know about Joseph. He was the young boy who was sold by his brothers into slavery into Egypt. He was thrown into prison under false accusations of committing adultery with his boss's wife. While in prison, he interprets dreams for people who are there and comes to the attention ultimately of the Pharaoh of Egypt, who when Joseph interprets his dream, he elevates Joseph to be second in command to rule and reign under him and have authority over all of the land of Egypt. That, in a brief summary, is Joseph. I want us to examine him today and some situations from his life that show to us and depict for us how God works sovereignly in the lives of his creation. I want us to examine a circumstance from Joseph taken from the book of Psalms. Now, the life of Joseph is described more clearly and in detail in the book of Genesis. But I want us to examine the account recorded in the book of Psalms, Psalm 105, and we'll read just a few verses from this particular psalm. The very first verse in Psalm 105 says this, O oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, Sing unto him with songs. Talk of all his wondrous works. And then the rest of the psalm goes on to explain and describe some of the works of God. His sovereign intervention into the lives of individuals, into the lives of peoples and nations. His control of events to bring about his own plans and purposes. As we drop down a little bit farther into this particular psalm, we come to a section of verses that talks about Joseph. And I want to read those, and then we'll study them for a few minutes today. Dropping down to verse number 16 of Psalm 105, we read this. Moreover, 
God called for a famine upon the land, and he broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free, and made him lord of his house and ruler of all of his substance, to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his senators wisdom. That's the brief little excerpt from Psalm 105 that describes some occurrences in the life of Joseph. And from this passage, I want us to examine some very certain and sure truths from God's Word about the sovereignty of God and how He works. It'll just be a very small glimpse. But I pray that the Holy Spirit will take these truths and apply them in your life today and help you come to a more full and complete understanding of how God sovereignly works in His creation. The first thing I want us to notice from the experience of Joseph and how God sovereignly worked in his life is that God's sovereignty prepares for the future. When God works sovereignly in the events of history and in the lives of men and women, He does so with an eye to the future. He is preparing things for what comes ahead. Things that He knows that He has not revealed to us. Things that He knows and has designed, in fact, to occur. But they are yet in the future. And He molds and shapes events and the lives of men and women, preparing them for the future. Now, we have a, a great fallacy that many people believe. In fact, there's two or three fallacies that people believe regarding events in our lives and even how they might have some relation or bearing to the future. For example, there are many people who believe in fatalism. Kind of the old saying made famous by a song a number of years ago, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. Fatalism. Viewing life from a fatalistic standpoint. There are others who believe that the events of life occur purely by chance. Kind of like a roll of the dice. And one day it rolls in my favor and another day it doesn't. It's just chance. And there are still others who believe that all events in life are under my control. And if I would just control them more properly, more intelligently, more carefully, then things would work out. And it's a very individualistic kind of approach to life. And that all of life depends solely upon me. And these are fallacies. For we see from the experience of Joseph that it is God who is at work behind events, behind people, behind the actions of individuals, behind the actions of nations. God is at work. And it is God who sovereignly intervenes to prepare for the future. Notice how it is described here in this psalm as it relates to Joseph. We read in verse number 17, it says, God sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold as a servant. Now, he's talking about the famine. Remember I read the verse that talked about that God sent a famine? And he sent it and he destroyed all of the crops and the ability to, to cultivate the land and to generate foods. Well, before that famine occurred, the Scriptures tell us God sent Joseph down there to be ahead, to be prepared, because Joseph was the one, and we can read about it more clearly in, in the book of Genesis. It was Joseph who was put in charge by the Pharaoh, as we read here in this psalm. The Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of the nation, and he took care of all of the foodstuffs, preparing for the famine that God sent. And how did God prepare for all of those people and make provision for the nation of Egypt as well as all of Joseph's family? He intervened in the life of Joseph. 
He sent him down to Egypt ahead of time, preparing him, putting him in place so that he would be there to resolve the problem that would ultimately face the nation of Egypt and all of the surrounding countryside. You see, God moves sovereignly to prepare for the future. And we read Joseph's account himself. He makes the statement in, in the book of Genesis when he's describing and talking to his brothers who had sold him as a slave. And he talks to them in Genesis chapter 50, verse number 20. He said, when you sold me as a slave, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God intervening and having sovereign control in the life of Joseph, his brothers, the people who came by and purchased him as a slave, and all of the other events that went together to get Joseph down to Egypt. Why? Because God was sending a man to prepare him, get him ready, have him in place so that when the famine came, he would have someone to resolve the issues. So when God works, He works sovereignly in our lives. He works sovereignly in the events of history. And why? To prepare for the future. That's one of the aspects of God's sovereignty. No, life doesn't come by chance. No, life does not fall under my sole jurisdiction. And no, life doesn't come just by fatalism. God is sovereign. He is in charge of events and of people and of individuals preparing for the future. I want you to notice the second thing that is shown in this passage about Joseph and the sovereignty of God, and that's this. God works sovereignly in the lives of individuals to purify them. He prepares for the future. That's one aspect of God's sovereign work. Another aspect of God's sovereign work is purification. He purifies His people. Now, when we stop and think about preparing individuals and preparing people for the future, most commonly we view preparation to entail education. We view it as experience. And we view it perhaps as having proper position. And these are all ways that we as humans view preparation for the future. And we view it entirely from a standpoint of a skill and abilities standpoint. We have the feeling that doing is more important than being. But when God prepares someone for His specific plan and purpose. God doesn't deal in those ways. The way that God deals is with purity of heart. It is within the individual. Development of character is of far greater value to God than skills and abilities. And we notice that in the experience of Joseph. For we read in Psalm 105, verses 18 and 19, it says that Joseph had been sent before them, but his feet were hurt with fetters. They laid him in iron. I mentioned at the beginning of our broadcast today that Joseph was thrown in prison for a while, innocently so. And while there, he suffered. They put his feet in irons. And then it says, until the time, until the time that the word came, the Lord tried him. Now that word tried is a very interesting word. And what it is talking about is the purity and the purifying of a metal by heat. We commonly think of gold and silver, for example, two very precious metals. And how are they refined and purified? By heat. You heat them and you heat them high enough so that the dross and the impurities flow off and are drawn off of the metal until all that you have left is pure gold or pure silver. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about the smelting pot. 
Joseph was put in the furnace. Joseph was smelted, to use the metaphor, in the life of Joseph. He was put through some very difficult trials and circumstances. Why? To purify him. To take away his self-reliance to take away dependence upon his own skills and abilities, and to put him in a place where he only could rely upon God. For you see, God was going to put him into a position where he needed to rely upon him solely. For he was going to face some difficulties in life that man could not resolve. It would require the work of God to resolve the issues that Joseph would face as second in command to Pharaoh. And how did God prepare him for that? By putting him in a blast furnace, by trying him, by melting away by heat the impurities and purifying Joseph that he might be the man of character that God would require to fulfill his plan and purpose. And we see this truth revealed in Scripture in a number of other places where the Scriptures talk about how God refines our character and purifies us. For example, we read in Hebrews chapter 12, that chapter talks about how God disciplines and corrects His people. And He does it in means that sometimes seem very harsh and difficult to us. But He does it that He might refine us and purify us and make us righteous and holy. It's people of character that God desires. He doesn't really care much about our abilities and our skills, for you see, God is omnipotent. He can do whatever He pleases. What He's interested in is our character. Purity of heart and mind, that He might refine us into holy, righteous people. We also read in First Peter, where we read there where it's, talks about the trial of our faith being more precious than gold that is tried by fire. We commonly view gold as the most precious of all metals, and it holds a very special place in our lives as having great significance and of high value. And it's tried with fire. It's purified with fire. And God says through his servant Peter, and he writes and he says, Your faith is of greater value than gold that is tried by fire. And if gold is tried by fire, and if our faith is of greater value than gold, then my friend, how are we going to be tried? By fire, by difficulty, by hardship. These things come into our lives not by chance, not through some fatalistic cause, not because we've blundered in some respect, but more likely it is that God has brought them into our lives to shape us, to purify us, to make us holy and righteous. We see God sovereignly working in the life of Joseph in this very fashion. He tried him until the right time. He was purifying his character. Well, we've seen thus far two aspects of God's sovereignty at work in the life of Joseph. One is preparation for the future. A second way that God's sovereignty is involved in our lives and the events of our lives is to purify us, to make us more holy, to make us righteous people before God, that He might develop our character. There's a third aspect that is shown here, and is just really kind of hinted at in this passage. It's more clearly developed in Genesis than the whole story of Joseph. But there's enough here for us to see the kernel of truth, and that's this. The purpose of God behind His sovereign rule. God prepares us. God purifies us. But what is the real ultimate purpose and design for God's sovereignty in our lives? Well, we read here in these verses that the king sent for Joseph, brought him out, elevated him to second in command, put him in charge of all of his goods and of all of his senators. When that occurred, 
we read of that description given to us in the book of Genesis. And we read it in Genesis chapter 41, where Joseph came before Pharaoh and interpreted his dreams, the dreams that foretold of the coming famine. And God gave to Joseph the ability to interpret the Pharaoh's dreams. When Joseph completed his interpretation of those dreams, Pharaoh described Joseph in this fashion in Genesis chapter 41. And he says, Where can we find a man in whom the Spirit of God dwells than Joseph? What did the Pharaoh see about Joseph? His skills? His abilities? No. What he saw in Joseph was the presence of God. God had completed his work. He had prepared Joseph in such a way not only for taking that position, but also in taking that position it might ultimately give honor and praise and glory to God. For that is the ultimate purpose and design of God's sovereign work. It is always, ultimately, for His own honor and glory. He worked in Joseph's life and brought him to Pharaoh at just the right time. Why? That Pharaoh might give praise and honor to God for what he saw in Joseph's life. And we see this in Scripture with other individuals as well. For example, we see it in the life of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, we read how the, the ruler of Babylon, where Daniel was living at the time, he was in exile from Israel. And while living there, God had used Daniel to be a great leader among the Babylonian Empire. And the ruler of Babylon saw in Daniel the presence of God. And we read in Daniel chapter 6, in fact, that the ruler of Babylon issued a decree that all of his people would recognize the God of Daniel as being the living, true God. Why does God work in sovereign ways and events and in the lives of people and of nations and individuals? that ultimately His name might receive honor, glory, and praise. Now as we come to a close here, I want to ask a few questions of you regarding our study. Now this isn't going to be a Bible quiz to see how much you remember from today's lesson. But rather, why is it that God is presenting these truths to you today? What purpose does He want to bring about in your life with these truths? Well, first of all, he wants to clarify for you the truth. He wants you to understand that God is a sovereign God. He's not a watchmaker God. He's not a caretaker God. He's not an old grandfather in the heavens just watching. Rather, he is a sovereign God who is in rulership and authority over events and people of his creation. And by your coming to understand and to know the truth, you might conform your life to the truth. You might disregard and set aside the fallacies, some of which we discussed throughout our broadcast today, and set them aside that you might instead believe and trust the truth. And in believing and in trusting the truth, begin to act upon that truth in your life. That it would change the way you think and how you live. That it would change your view about the events that come across your life in your day-to-day -day experience. So the first thing that the Spirit of God wants these truths to do is to clarify for you the truth. Secondly, the Spirit of God wants to convict you of sin. Where in your life today has the Spirit of God opened your eyes to see where you have believed that which is false? Perhaps you've believed that life is just all chance. Perhaps you've believed that life all depends upon you. Perhaps you've believed that life is just... ...trusted His sovereign work and authority in the events of life. 
Spirit of God today perhaps opened your eyes to see your failure to, on the one hand, even know the truth, and then perhaps on another, where you have failed to believe the truth. There's another reason why the Spirit of God would bring these truths to you today, and that is to correct you. He's opened your eyes today to see the truth, that He might bring correction into your life. Not that he might be a mean ogre and a nasty man who inflicts great punishment and harm at a whim, but rather that he might purify you, that he might make you holy and righteous and bring you to become the person that only God can make you to become. He wants to correct you today. And in order to correct you, he's got to convince you of your true condition before God. Has he shown you today to be innocent or guilty? Has he approved or disapproved and reproved of the way you've believed and acted in the past? You see, by opening your eyes to see the truth, he can now bring you to conformity to what is the truth, that it might affect your life and change you, that you might become a believer in Jesus Christ and trust him, that you perhaps as a believer in Christ might trust him in new and different ways that would change your life and revive you from the inside out. My prayer is that the Spirit of God will take these truths today and apply them in your life. Bring about a change in your life. Bring you perhaps today to the first time of faith in Jesus Christ. Or perhaps as a believer in Jesus today, to remind you that God is sovereign and He is at work in your life, purifying you and preparing you for his purpose, to bring honor and glory to his name.